Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report. We are joined by Tim Alexander, again, one of our team members for our live stream uh, clips that you'll see posted up periodically. And, of course, uh, his blog, europebusiness.blogspot.com. You can Google Lord Sterling, S-T-I-R-L-I-N-G, and you'll find the blog. Very important articles and analysis because you'll not see a lot of the historical military geopolitical analysis that's more smack on than, than Tim. Uh, Tim, you see some things happening in the Mideast. The, apparently today the uh, Syrian government took back control of the airport that they lost. Uh, they also the airport some road. Uh, yeah, the airport yeah, yeah. road. They also you lost, know, some, uh, uh, lost here, some internet the uh, as well. The, the, the foreign terrorists, the foreign rebels uh, that are fighting, uh, Qatar, uh, United Arab Emirates, uh, Oman, uh, Bartrain, uh, and of course Saudi Arabia, as well as the various NATO countries, in particular the United States, United Kingdom, France, and Germany, have poured an enormous amount of, of strategic resources, money, arms, personnel, uh, as well as intelligence uh, operatives into the struggle against Syria, because Syria is the back door to starting a war with Iran. And all this is necessary because they want to, well, on one level, they want to re redevelop the Middle East into their way. But what they really want to do is to start a global war. Uh, and we'll go there in a second. Okay, now, um, it can pop up battles at any one given location fairly well. And uh, Oman now is supplying uh, shoulder launch anti aircraft missiles. Uh, to them. Uh, literally yesterday, uh, there was photographic proof that the Turks are turning over uh, and, and setting up tanks uh, on, near the Turkish border that uh, for the, the so-called rebel forces. I mean, you know, you're talking about heavy armor now. Um, so they can move and move in uh, fairly uh, quickly, and, and uh, they shot down a helicopter uh, today with uh, uh, a, uh, a small missile, a shoulder launch missile, and that's something they haven't been able to do uh, with a missile before. So it reduces the ability of, uh, of, of the Syrians to, uh, to slow them down a little bit. So at any one place, they can apply pressure. And that's what we saw today. There was an article that was written uh, probably yesterday morning, uh, which I have a second on my, my news blog, Europe Today. NATO prepares PSYCOP in Syria. And uh, basically, and the article was right on, basically the article said what was going to happen today. And it said in early summer, NATO attempted to overwhelm Damascus uh, with a, a torrent of psychological operations, communications disruptions, foreign terrorists uh, crossing the border, uh, the assassination of uh, several members of the Syrian war cabinet in the heart of Damascus, etc., etc. And a lot of people thought that was going to cause the fall of the uh, Sy uh, Syrian government. It didn't, of course. So today you're seeing kind of a repeat of that. And there is this effort to, to rack up uh, events. Now, if we back off two weeks and look at, at what was happening a couple of weeks ago, you had uh, Israel massing uh, an enormous uh, uh, army on the border uh, of tiny Gaza Strip with 1.7 million uh, essentially unarmed civilians in it. It is a giant open-air prison. And uh, it, basically, it's a concentration camp. And uh, the Germany, France, the United Kingdom, and the United States all put intense pressure on Bibi Netanyahu, my candidate for the Bibiko Antichrist himself, uh, not to invade. And at the end, uh, there was uh, a, a, a ceasefire agreement, and the Israelis did not invade Gaza Strip. Four years ago, they did, and they killed thousands of unarmed civilians, mostly children and women. And uh, they, they came pretty close to setting off uh, military coups in, in some Arab countries even then, uh, so that the, the the military wanted to literally turn their guns and their their jets against the Israelis to defend their fellow Arabs. What Netanyahu was doing, and and I I, I said at the time he walked into a trap. Uh, he was turning this uh, globalist inspired um, war in Syria, he and the Middle East. He was turning this into a. Um, Arab versus Israeli, Muslim versus Jew battle, and uh, that, that was unacceptable 
because there was a, a, a break in the strategic goals of Netanyahu and his war cabinet and the globalists. Netanyahu basically wants to start a big general Middle East war that he will probably use nuclear weapons to finish once and for all, to, to clean out all of his enemies, uh, Iran and, and, and many of the Arab states. Uh, that is not the strategic goal of the globalists. Uh, the global banking cartel families, their strategic goal is to create, uh, by via a war there, but to create a global war that they will control. And you have to understand, you have to understand history, the history of the 20th century, and even going back further beyond that to, to the, the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars, which were the first true global wars. Uh, these people create wars uh, for several reasons. One, they profit dramatically from the sale of arms and uh, from uh, the issue in their bonds and so forth. War is the greatest generator of debt. Debt is profit to those who own the Federal Reserve System and, and other central banks. They create money out of thin air and loan it to governments. And uh, then the governments have to pay the principal back, plus compound interest, et cetera, et cetera. Exactly. And if they lose, the, their, the victors have to guarantee that the, the, the losers will, will pay the bankers back. And it, it always happens that way. So, Tim, where, also, where, is this course, going in, where is this going in 2013, if we were to summarize? We've got the, uh, the smoldering uh, situation in Gaza, which basically the United Nations wants to give them beyond observer status, a true status as an independent state, which means they can have a right for to sign the International Court of Justice so they can file charges against Israel, uh, because a lot of the things that were done by Israel are crimes. They have the... Uh, but they're, they're crimes anyway. They're, they're, they're war crimes under uh, a, a variety of, of international treaties, and, and they're, right. not, they're not held to account for them. So I'm, I'm not sure... And by the way, the Israelis don't want to stop the rocket forces. They could have easily stopped the rocket parts arriving from Iran. They don't. And the reason is they... I mean, people don't understand this. The Hamas was trained by Shin Bet in Israel. Hamas was trained as the crazy arm uh, to create the dialectic of chaos because the globalists are the ones that run, run Israel. It's not run for the safe of citizens safety in Israel, whether they're secular agnostics, Jews, Orthodox Jews, or uh, any other religious group, including Arab Christians, which, by the way, the largest number of Christians in Israel are Arab. And a lot of the new Christians are former Soviet uh, members that come down from the Soviet Union as Jews and be convert to Messianic Christianity. And they get treated with great disrespect by the Israeli government because they'll make statements they want to make it a either a secular Jewish state, which is really, they don't really like even the religious Jews. People don't understand that the original state of Israel was founded as a secular, agnostic, communist state with members of the Knesset actually being conjointly members of the Russian Duma, the leading the party that controls the Soviet Union, so the Russia. Uh, yeah, people don't the, know this the, history. The, uh, you know, the uh, kibbutzes were, were as about as communist as you can get. Yeah, and, exactly. I mean, I, I had friends that lived in Israel. Uh, my roommate in college, his dad was U.S. military attache in Israel, uh, and his uh, girlfriend became his wife. Uh, her father was uh, uh, one of the top diplomats in the Middle East. And they used to go to go to Mir's house as, as teenagers for, for barbecues when she was prime minister. Right. Right. And, I mean, I used to hear all this stuff from the inside and, uh, and that uh, many of the girls that, that lived on the kibbutzes were beautiful, but they didn't shave under their arms or their legs and, you know, and all this stuff. They were very radical leftist. Uh, yeah, and they, 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 they were not them. religious, but the, 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 the cultural uh, imperative in Israel has changed dramatically over the last... Uh, one to two decades because of the influx of people from Eastern Europe. Exactly. Uh, when we get back, we'll talk about this more because people need to understand that they want the conflict to continue. They want the dialectic to continue. No, oh, yeah. Welcome back. Um, 
I want to change direction for just a minute, uh, Tim, and I get your opinion. I just pulled up some articles. One is the charities fight to keep tax break on donations. What I think has happening, I posted that clip up in the first hour with Bonner uh, saying that two weeks ago we had a productive discussion with the abominator, uh, but basically nothing's happening. The Democrats are living in la la land. Uh, the tiny amount, eight and a half days, it'll be raised by taxing everybody that makes over 250000 In fact, the calculation is if you taxed every single cent of everybody that makes over 250000 it would only fund the government for something like 60 days or something. The fact is that over If you put a judgment. fraction of a penny uh, tax on every uh, transaction on Wall Street, you could take care of our deficit. Oh, of course. And the other thing is you have put... Uh, there glass, are solutions, back. Bill, but they yeah, don't yeah. want the solutions. No, they don't. And the reason why they don't want the solution is they want to blow up the dollar. They want to blow up the debt. They want to crush the middle class as much as they say. And what I see coming here in 2013 is this. And people need to take this date down and say, Deagle and Tim said this back in 2012 on the date of November 29th that here's what they're going to do. They want to give us austerity fascism next year. And Obama, as much as he passed, quote, Obamacare, which is basically an unfunded mandate that basically doesn't control costs. It was written by the insurance carriers and the drug companies. And he's going to be apologized into the situation where he will sacrifice so-called entitlements. And then the Republicans, despite the fact they say they're not going to tax the middle class and the and the rich, they're going to tax everybody. So basically, everybody's going to get the worst of poss all possible worlds. Well, and also, both parties, uh, both parties uh, will blame the other guy. Are, are Full-time employees are going to become part-time employees. Well, they're already doing it. We already hear reports. The, the, the depression we're already in. I already hear reports. I got a report this morning about another person that when he got hired, the employer said, we can only give you 25 hours because if we give you more than that, we got to give you uh, health benefits. Luckily, this employee already had health insurance through another source. But that's happening all the time. Employers are basically saying, you're now part-time, no benefits, and have a nice day. So uh, what's happening is the states are not going to join these so-called health exchanges. Obamacare is dead in the water. They may have passed it uh, when they had a mandate the first two years. It was never properly done. It was stillborn, basically a bill that was written by insurance carriers. It's just not going to I, I You know, uh, a last, uh, let's see, I guess it was night before last, I had a, uh, a, uh, a, a relative of mine gave me an interesting observation. Um, he said, remember the movie, um, how, what was the uh, uh, Jimmy Stewart movie, At Christmas Time, The Angel Saved Him From Jumping in the Water? Uh, a Beautiful Life. A Beautiful Life. Yes. Yeah. And the evil banker. And if he hadn't been there, the evil banker took over, and the village, the city became Potterville, and crime just went out of control, and everyone was, uh, or most people were in poverty, and the mor morality went to hell. And he said, you know, that's what's happened in America, and it has, it has. Yeah. The ba the evil bankers have taken over. And, right. uh, and look at Detroit. They've literally plowed up part of the city because the houses are abandoned. And the only thing that's worth anything is the land, so they're actually farming part of the city of Detroit. Oh uh, and it's more and more. California, where everything begins in my lifetime, trends begin in California and, and move east. Well, you have cities going bankrupt. Uh, crime has gone through the ceiling. When I was a child, okay, I'm getting old. Christmas Eve, I'm going to be 62. When I was a child, our side door wasn't locked. And sometime between 4 and 5.30 a.m., two or three days a week, the milkman came. And uh, he let himself in the, the kitchen door. And you had a, a little note taped to uh, the refrigerator or by the refrigerator. If you wanted a quart of milk or, or some ice cream or butter, uh, you know, he... You told him what you wanted. He put it in the refrigerator and left. Uh, and once a month, the meter reader came, and uh, he would yell, meter reader, as he came in the door. He'd walk uh, through the kitchen down uh, downstairs to her cellar where the gas meter was. He'd read it and walk out. Now, of course, <laughs> if you tried that today, the guy, poor guy wouldn't make it through, uh, through a morning without being full of holes. But uh, he wouldn't get in most houses because they're locked up tighter than a drum because everybody's scared. Uh, 
And Harlem, which has a terrible reputation in terms of violence, well, Harlem was an extremely safe community. Uh, you didn't have you didn't have uh, uh, rampant drug use. By the way, in Portugal, and now they're talking about it in Uruguay, uh, they legalized all illegal drugs, and they're treating uh, the drug uh, uh, problem as a medical addiction problem, not as a criminal problem. That's what I was- Welcome back, and uh, Tim, uh, I think we're joined by Chris Harris. Chris, uh, you don't have a lot of stories this week, but uh, we want to get your perspective. They've now done what we talked about a year ago, which is to make a radiation harbor robot called a, a Toshiba robot to operate inside Fukushima and find out what's wrong. The fact that they're now looking a year and a half later means there's a lot of real bad stuff that they, they either don't know what's going on don't want the public to know what's going on, or it's so screwed up now they can't fix it at all, and now they at least have a radiation-resistant robot to kind of walk in there, one of these walking, kind of looks like a, a headless goat or something, I guess, going in there. It, Tell it, us about this robot. But it's amazing that they that they even um, came out with something. I, I mean, it, it, it's been over, you know, well, well over a year, but there's a lot of research that went into that. So let's you now they're testing it, so it's not really fully functional. Yeah, it's and a pretty, pretty big robot, too. It's a, that, um, uh, the hiding of any facts. But I, I have a feeling that it's more like any information that they let out was really unconfirmed or unverified, and now we're finally, if this works, we're going to get some eyes on, even if they're cameras, camera eyes, on the real situation there, maybe, maybe we'll release some real good information. About, I have three uh, questions. Number one, uh, uh, what uh, kind uh, of uh, chips uh, are in it uh, to make sure it's radiation kind of resistant? On unit three first, yeah. but um, you know that's that's something that you, you know when you say that uh, they didn't have, they were not releasing information. I know, I I told you all along they really didn't know, and every inf- bit of information that we got out, you have to really take with a grain of salt and really. Really think right, about but, they, but, they, but they wouldn't let the public come up with even better ideas. There's three questions I'd ask. Number one is, what kind of chips are in this so it's radiation hardened? If it's anything other than a ferromagnetic chip made by Atmel Corporation, basically the only ones I know that are truly uh, radiation hardened and hardened against cosmic background radiation, it'll probably get fried. Number two, I want to know how they're going to see through steam unless you use infrared or other types of cameras that can see through this to actually see what's going on in the area. Most of these chambers are full of either debris, fallen pieces of things. So this tetrapod robot has to walk through this mess. Does it have cutter charges? Does it have ways, you know, arms that have a saw there? Does it have torches to cut and weld through things? And the third question I'm going to ask is, whatever data they're going to have, is it going to be released to the public or is it just going to be sequestered by the industry to say everything's cool, we've been inside now? And it's, in other words, a, another <coughs> information control op to say, Robot has been inside. Robot's happy. Public, you be happy now. Yeah, well, <laughs> Does that make sense? Uh, eat the food grown in the area. You'll glow in the dark. Yeah, well, by the way, they're exporting Japanese food from the area of Fukushima and surrounding prefectures, sending it to America, and people are buying it here in the United States, including sushi and other food, even fruit and so on, grown. As I say, it's going to add hair on your chest. Only the hair might be a little greenish purple. <laughs> well, this, this robot is pretty interesting. I mean, it's carrying aboard a smaller robot that's detachable. And, you know, that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty high-tech stuff. And uh, stuff that science fiction is uh, always made based on come true. Uh, but it's not the one that's going to do the work. It's not really that's. I mean, we're, we're really way off now. I mean, there's yeah, this is only a standing work. robot. I don't see any arms on it. It's just a tetrapod. I know we have radiation-resistant deep space exploration robots available through DARPA, but in Warehouse 13, the Americans aren't going to bust this out. That's one of the reasons why the Russians and Chinese have been so terrified. Even though we gave them nuclear materials and technologies and allowed their scientists to literally walk into our facilities for advanced weapons developments and rockets, the Russians and Chinese have been terrified that we're holding back on them because guess what? We are. We're not releasing our radiation-resistant deep space exploration robots, which could have fixed this a year and a half ago, could have helped with containment of this mess, and it's going to continue bubbling like a cauldron and burping up giant clouds of radiation, and people think it's all gone away because it's not front and center in the news, and 
Uh, the CNN staff are not there with a the camera crew. It's just sickening that uh, we don't have that. I have no response, by the way, still from Senator Feinstein, who got reelected for a fourth term. I have no response from Senator Wyden. Uh, it's, and Senator Feinstein, by the way, is our, my senator from my part of the state of California. I'm not pleased with you, Senator Feinstein. I think you and your so-called nuclear expert are are basically obfuscating the issues, and uh, your nuclear expert is a blithering idiot. And I asked questions. I got no straight answers. He tried to say that everything was just fine, that the RADNET and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission were operating fully above board, and they know what's going on. Everything is fine. Go back to sleep. And I asked tough questions, and I got no answers. None. Not even the idea of even you know, monitoring airborne uh, radiation plumes and doing computer modeling, like my idea to put them in commercial aircraft. I had zero, I mean zero, response. I, I could uh, just clarify one thing, and that is going back to what, what I said about nobody, industry or government, was ever ready for a Fukushima-type event. And uh, I'm going what, what? to uh, uh, well, I, 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 could, I could actually support that argument. In today's Japan Times, the, the 29th, uh, the IAEA has now decided to use the Fukushima Prefecture facility, that's Fukushima, as a base for nuclear crisis uh, cooperation. Why haven't they done that already? How come there wasn't a pre-plan to do that years ago? You know, th these are supposed to be the collective experts uh, in the whole world. And... Uh, so that's kind of late, that is what I'm saying. I could send you that article, too. Um, yeah, they made the nuclear American scientists met in Tokyo this week to study the Fukushima crisis in hopes of finding lessons. I can tell them a number of talking points that they should address. Number one, why would you build nuclear reactors in, in Earthquake Central? Number two, why would you, knowing in both in America and other countries where similar Mark I and Mark II design reactors had problems, you didn't address it or you did a faux design, which is a false design, they couldn't withstand the pressures of releasing hydrogen, so were the two group of engineers fighting each other as to whether they should release the hydrogen because they didn't think they could control it from causing a hydrogen-based explosion. So they built up a reactor, so they end up reactor core actually split in reactor one. And this was, by the way, happened even before the Sendai tsunami struck. The second question I'd ask them to, to address is, how many of these reactors in the United States within, within strike zone of earthquakes or extreme weather and the fact is we know that station blackouts can cause these reactors to go hot critical, like the, uh, the, uh, the 10-hour power blackout here in Southern California that caused the reactor up at San Onofre, 12 miles from where I am, to go hot and release a massive cloud of radiation for four days afterwards, which I monitored on my wife's dresser. So I don't have answers from these morons, and I'm not happy at all. And when they try to whitewash it and they have a new so-called Nuclear Regulatory Commission director, that basically is whitewashing it and kind of very, very low-key now. You know, after they get rid of JASCO, they're basically doing nothing. The fact is it's extremely likely in the next, it's already a, they quote, this is conservative, 1 in 50 chance in the next 20 years we're going to have a new Madrid superquake. 1 in 50, that's pretty high. I'd say it's more like 1 in 5 or 10 in the next uh, 20 years. It's really likely. Secondly, the chances of when you have nuclear reactors where you have extreme weather, earthquakes, or volcanoes of losing control. Just with Sandy, we had two reactors that got hot shut down, the Oyster Creek, and there was another facility. Which one was that, Chris? Well, actually, there were several of them. There's a, a, a couple of them up in upstate New York. I can't remember. It was either, uh, uh, not Fitzpatrick, Nine Mile Point, and another <coughs> one, uh, the Susquehanna plant. And they, they, all, they, all, they all felt... Uh, system grid perturbations that right uh, so, here's a here's that, the situation real scenario I'm going to make it like I'm a mini series here in about 20 seconds it is May 13th 2013 I'm just pulling the date, date out of the air it's not prophetic or otherwise uh, US has been monitoring space agency uh, major changes on the Sun the Sun's acting weird and all of a sudden uh, solar scientists detect a major pulse almost like a P wave in an earthquake, of uh, plasma heading toward the Earth, and they get a, a warning to shut down the energy production from the, from the nuclear reactors, but they don't have surge protectors and grounding of all of the, reactor, of all of the power grid transformers. So guess what? By the way, they arc and we blow our power grid all to hell. 85% of the power grid in North America is gone. Gone. Uh, four days later, no fuel, no food, 
And after so many days, by the way, they can't even pump water into the homes because they can't treat the sewage because the sewage doesn't have backup generators. Social chaos collapsing into the 17th century. That's where we're going. People don't understand. The nuclear reactors, no power. Boom. Welcome back. And um, I'm doing uh, quite a bit of research. I want to get your opinion, Chris. But uh, most people know about the Higgs HIGGS boson and uh, quantum cohesion, which basically means the Higgs uh, boson is supposed to give mass to all objects, including protons, neutrons, electrons. So matter won't fly apart. <clears throat> it's also supposed to explain what's called dark matter, which makes up uh, probably up to 90% of the matter in the universe. And it means that space itself is not empty. Space actually is conformational. So as we pass every 62 million years from the galactic plane, which we started 15 years ago, midpoint just so happens to be December 21st. It doesn't mean something's going to happen on that date, but after you transition through that, you transfer into what's called a different conformational Higgs field, which means the conformation of time-space has a direct effect on plasma physics, which is, of course, every object in the known universe, including stars that are nuclear fusion reactors, uh, so they fuse helium or heavy elements and to make heavier and heavier elements, and the Earth, which is basically a nuclear reactor with a crust on it. So what it means is we're going to have major superstorms, very likelihood in the next number of years of a lithospheric crustal slip, which means the mantle and the crust are going to change and slide like a, a the skin of a peach that's been heated with steam. We're very likely to see major superstorms, and they've already predicted solar cycle 24, 2013, 2014 are going to be badass major superstorms, which means we haven't heard in our grid. We've had Mishu Ikaku. We've even had Jesse Ventura ask uh, on his True TV the same kind of questions. We've had other scientists talk about this, and the congressmen and senators are looking like, I, I don't know, they look at us like a deer in the headlights, just like, well, why would we want to do that? It's only $200 billion, million dollars to fix it. They, the General Accounting Office has calculated out that the cost of just the CME, we're not even talking about all the other catastrophic things that could happen, just a bad CME, a Harrington event of 1859, and we're, you know, <laughs> that's not that long ago, just a Harrington event of that magnitude would literally collapse our civilization and cost a minimum of 5 to $20 trillion. They don't even know how much. When you get into the trillions, it's like, okay, we'll start off with 5 and it's going up. And the cost in human lives, I mean, you got to remember, at two-week mark, if you have no power, people become cannibalistic. People that were normal citizens start to become hungry, starving, dehydrated, and I, I call it the zombie apocalypse. And people think, oh, that can't happen. Uh, well, we're, not, we're, we're, not, we're not even returning to the agrarian society where people grow food. Like, at least if people had grown food on the roof of their apartment building in a downtown skyscraper, that would be good. Uh, but people don't have a, a victory garden. People don't have extra water stored. And they don't understand that in every district of the United States, the same with Australia, New Zealand, and Western countries, they have backup power for water. There's no backup for sewage treatment. So after so many days, they can't pump it or your toilet's back up with raw sewage. Yeah, so, I, I kind of teach something <clears throat> like this in college because I, I talk about what happened when the Roman legions left and, and, peop and Europe went into the Dark Ages. And it was so cataclysmic, it took centuries before we even hardly had much data, much historical data. They're dark ages because they didn't even keep any records. It was so terrible. Right. And now, what I want to tell people is that the globalists are preparing. You've got to look at what they call the evidence of what's happening. And I want to get your opinion, Tim, on this. They're building underground cities at an unbelievable pace. In fact, I just talked to one of our visitors that dropped by, and he lives up uh, near the Holloman Air Force Base. Holloman Air Force Base, by the way, has an autonomous, fully uh, autonomous and separate controlled German Air Force Base. Did you know that? Did you know that they're in, and this is part of what's called the, the Luftwaffe never surrendered, they're part of Operation Paperclip, to the United States or Britain or the West. Did you know that we have... Well, they, they don't have the, 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 <clears throat> the airspace uh, in Germany. Europe they have, that we have out west. But they have a giant airspace. This, this is the largest uh, military uh, air force base on Earth. It covers four different states. It's, it actually could be bigger than a lot of these little tiny eastern states. The fact is that one of the facilities, and they're building them on the side of this mountain in Holloman Air Force Base, was a paving area 150 feet wide, I think 200 feet high, 
uh, in this area coming into the side of a mountain and going in 10 miles into the mountain so they can carry these giant super rigs carrying equipment. They're spending hundreds of trillions of dollars on things. It's, like, it's not like they're preparing this for, for a little minor thing. And this isn't even preparing for something simple like an, even a nuclear attack. They're preparing for something far more cataclysmic. <clears throat> and here's the real facts. And it, people may think this is sci-fi, but it's not. Number one, they've been keeping the bloods for roughly 40 years of everybody born in the Western world, first and second nations. And they take those heel prick bloods and they're kept in a facility and they're tracking people that they want to genetically have as seed stock, even if they don't know that they're inducted. They've already decided which globalists and elite and congressmen, senators, and politicians are going to go to, quote, get a ticket to go underground, just like the movie, you know, uh, 2012. They've already made a decision that they're going to preserve about half a billion people underground all over in all the countries of the world. This is not imaginary. People say, oh, no, that can't happen. I say, look, they might not even have a total, you know, tapped down to a specific date. They just know there's a series of cataclysms coming that are going to be so horrific. And to be honest with you, if we have good science, we probably can survive better on the ground than underground. Uh, if we have, for example, we're going to be bringing on these uh, new... Uh, Special support they call the uh, the uh, uh, tents that can stand up to 800 mile an hour winds. You can buy it at a very reasonable cost, and they're actually constructed with a special uh, buckyball type filter, uh, uh, ten, you know, uh, uh, aircraft aluminum uh, frames, etc. You can survive. You have to be ready for the fact that earthquakes be at such high level. You can't be inside your home because it's going to come down over your ears. You have to realize that there may be radiation from background ultraviolet light that may be so dangerous. You can't go outside during the day. If you do, you're going to get fried. People don't think that. They don't think, oh, the ozone layer, it'll, be, it'll still be there. Not necessarily. And it doesn't even have to go long. It can go for a few days, weeks, or months. If you go outside during the day, you're going to get cooked. And I'm talking well, about second degree burns. when you start talking about burns, so. at quantum <clears throat> level, uh, you, 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 you're changing the basis for everything we don't uh, essentially well, the, we don't know what's going to happen well what the higgs field is basically is what's called the fifth dimensional field we don't live in a four dimensional world we live in a five the higgs field actually forms wormholes uh when you look at a star the the center of a galaxy it has what's called a black hole and there's a connection to what's called white holes in the center of all our stars our stars just don't appear they're almost like christmas lights the energy that drives the nuclear reaction in the star is driven from the black hole in the center Every black hole in the center is 2.5% of the mass of every galaxy, no matter how small or big. And every white hole emerges in planets and stars that re-emerges energy, so that's why they're able to, they're energized. The nuclear reactions aren't just driven by the mass of the star. It's driven by what's called a Higgs field, which creates the field to actually organize the matter. The matter isn't created just by gravity. The Higgs field organizes gravity and the particulates so they don't fly apart. So you don't have giant gas clouds that just kind of decide to organize into stars and all of a sudden start spinning and become a galaxy. You have the Higgs field that organizes all of that. And so curved time space, which is the fifth dimension, when you transition from the, the south pole to the north pole of the galactic plane, that transfer happened 62 million years ago with the dinosaurs. At the same time, yes, there was an impact at the Yucatan Peninsula, but the primary thing that changed was the Higgs field. We changed in the confirmation of the Higgs field that changed the plasma physics of our world. That's what happened. And they, they know that's why CERN has got all these symbols all over it of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the, uh, the, the destroyer, you know, from Kali, you know, from, from India. It, your comments, uh, uh, Tim and uh, Chris. Well, what I say is if we're talking something so basic, <clears throat> fundamental, we don't really yeah. know. I mean, my Yes, they God. do actually know. you got to well, understand. But, uh, tier we one, don't, we tier know no, some no, things. No, 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 let me explain to him. Tier 1 science is centuries ahead of what Tier 2 scientists at universities are tenured know. Okay? So you got to understand, when you hear this come out from CERN that they may be doing this and that project, they are centuries ahead of what you think they have. Just like our real space program, some of the questions I can ask is, Tim, um, how come we haven't been back to the moon? Have we ever been back to the moon? Oh, well, uh, some of the comments I've heard is, we did everything we had to do at the moon. I don't think so. One of the very first things you told me at Space Command is we control every cubic centimeter of space between here and Mars, not just the moon. And I said to the, the director of Space Command, I said, no, no, you mean the, uh, the moon. He said, no, listen up here, Doc. 
and he got real mad at me, real like hot mad, like a t come to Jesus talk. That no, and you have to understand this because you're now one of ours, and we don't want you to freak out when you find out the truth. That they bifurcated science, they bifurcated the civilization. They don't give a rat's behind what happens to most of the population. And the same thing why they didn't set up a real health care plan. They put in Obamacare, which is an abomination. Didn't control costs and provide health care at a reasonable cost to everybody. Didn't integrate natural medicine, anti-aging, and the fact that we are approaching the biological singularity that no one needs within five years to ten years to even get physiologically older. They don't talk about scalar biology or nutraceuticals or genetic engineering or anything to try to prevent aging or disease of any kind or even reverse it because they don't want the solution. And I've talked about this right with, with God. Dr. Ron Klaps, the director of anti-aging medicine and CEO of A4M, and he agrees 100%.